Okay, recording is uh, in progress. So, welcome to the first episode of this new podcast called New Voices in Phenomenology, where we are um, talking to researchers doing phenomenology in all kinds of fields and um, really just finding out what are the current issues, interests, and trends. And today we have with us um, Ellie Anderson of uh, Pomona College, where she's assistant professor and where she's working on selfhood and personal identity, phenomenology, the philosophy of love, ethics, and sexual ethics. Um, thank you, uh, Ellie. Thank you very much for joining us uh, today. And uh, yeah. my first Thanks, question, Daniel. yes, uh, my first question would be really, um, how would you explain what phenomenology is to someone who has no like previous philosophical like knowledge? Yeah. I would describe phenomenology as a method or set of methods that begin with lived experience. Um, what lived experience means is going to differ between phenomenologists, and not all of them are going to like that term very much. But more or less, the idea is that we have to start from where we are. Each of us finds ourselves in a world with a particular perspective on that world. And that needs to be the starting point for any kind of philosophy. Otherwise, we're going to just sort of perpetuate um, perhaps assumptions that persist based on our perspective without actually being able to analyze them. So phenomenology is often an inquiry into lived experience from the first person perspective and really an attempt to probe what the structures of that experience are. So it starts from this sort of first person perspective, but the ultimate goal is to gain a transcendental understanding of what the structures of experience themselves are. So it's a study of lived experience, but it doesn't end with individual lived experience. It aims for greater structures. Now, that general uh, definition of phenomenology, as I implied before, is going to apply more to some philosophers than others. I think it's a pretty fair, broad strokes characterization of classical phenomenology emerging out of Edmund Husserl. Um, Martin Heidegger will take issue with the idea of this subjective or first person perspective and argue that um, actually our experience of the world is so fundamentally outer directed that we really can't start from a quote perspective in the mental sense, but rather we have to think about the everyday practices that we're caught up in. And then there's existential phenomenology, of course, which we get with people like Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre, which are interested uh, definitely in the subjective first person perspective, in some ways really double down on that, but then are uh, curious about what that means for human freedom and ethics, especially and then you have more recently a move towards what's been called critical phenomenology, which is uh, a series of attempts to take phenomenological tools and really think about them in terms of social justice projects. How do our perspectives um, work to reinforce structures that we should really be critical of, such as sexism and racism? And um, how can phenomenology help us address those social problems? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, what's very interesting, what just the way that you um, sort of gave in this um, um, overview of the also history of phenomenology is that we start with questioning the structures of consciousness in general, like with Husserl, mm -hmm. and then uh, we end up with a critical phenomenology where we criticize the structures of not probably um, consciousness itself, but of our lived experience and of our way of seeing things. Mm -hmm. So would you say there's still sort of the same phenomenological um, kind of questioning that um, gets at the heart of both kinds of structures? Or is this a very like a paradigm shift that's happening here? I don't think it's a paradigm shift. I think it's a deepening of themes you already see in earlier phenomenology. And scholars are a bit divided on whether critical phenomenology constitutes a break with traditional phenomenology or whether it is just a shift in attention to things that 
classical phenomenology or tradition, other traditional forms of phenomenology already give us. I myself am a bit agnostic as of the, this interview. I know that there have been some recent publications to come out about this that I'm interested in reading but haven't had a chance to yet um, that will help me figure out what my own view is on this. But I think for now, where I land on this is that critical phenomenology is a new term for particular kinds of attention that have been drawn to, like I said, uh, really real social structures. But that phenomenology from the beginning has had the ability to uh, draw our attention to those social structures and to change them. And you know, you see in various forms of critical phenomenology the use of different classical phenomenological approaches. For instance, the epoche, this um, idea that we need to bracket our belief that the world around us is external and, quote, real, right? We we tend to have this natural attitude that the things outside of me are outside of me, right? The things that seem outside of me are actually outside of me. And there is this um, sort of mind-world relation. And one of phenomenology's first steps is uh, historically to bracket out that belief, that belief that the external world is external to me. And um, in critical phenomenology, you see this very same thing because being able to bracket out that belief is really helpful for resisting things like implicit bias and drawing our attention to the ways that implicit bias structures our experience. But critical phenomenologists will often draw attention to the fact that the epoche is not something we can completely do. We can't bracket out the natural attitude fully. This is already a view that you see, for instance, in Maurice Merleau-Ponty uh, in you know the mid-century, uh, mid-20th century in France. So it's not an entirely new idea, but I think a lot of critical phenomenologists are especially inspired by Merleau-Ponty because of his interest in uh, the body, his recognition that our situatedness in the world can't ever lead to a full bracketing of the natural attitude. But I do see classical and critical phenomenology as as quite compatible and as perhaps more of a continuum than a break. But I also tend to be a philosopher who sees more continua than breaks anyway. So I don't know if that's just a personality quirk. Um, it's, it's interesting that you do, you mentioned the uh, epoche because it's just such a central part of the phenomenological method and it's also one that's very controversial and there's so many interpretations, what actually gets yeah. bracketed out and what what is left remaining and so on. So this really leads me to my second question, which is um, what are some of the topics that you work on and do you consider phenomenology to offer a cohesive method or a coherent method to, to tackle these questions? Yeah. The main two areas of my work, which you mentioned, are uh, approaches to selfhood. Who are we? How are we related to others? With a special emphasis on the idea that the self is not a substantial thing, but um, is multiple, if we want to put it in substantial terms, but even better relational. And then the second area is um, phenomenology of love and sex, which maybe we could say those are even two different areas in and of themselves. But I do think that phenomenology is really rich for both or all three of those areas because of the set of tools that it provides. Um, I completely agree with the phenomenological perspective that we have to start from where we are and we can't start from a sort of view from nowhere or a presumed objectivity. And I know that sounds kind of obvious, but I think when you read phenomenology, you realize that it's actually not obvious and that a lot of philosophy has tried to, to start from a place other than that and has been unsuccessful for that reason. Um, I think I am more sympathetic to the idea that phenomenology can really get us quite far in understanding approaches to selfhood, love, and sex now than maybe I was 10 years ago. When I was doing my graduate work, I actually didn't write my dissertation on phenomenology. I wrote my dissertation on Derrida, who is uh, emerging out of the phenomenological tradition, but actually quite critical of it, and who is known as um, you know, the founder, if we can say that, of deconstruction, which is quite resistant to phenomenology. I think from, uh, from the perspective, if we can call it that, of deconstruction, phenomenology appears a bit naive because of its faith in the first-person perspective. 
But I actually think that there's resources within phenomenology for showing that the first person perspective is not just this like thing that we have access to. The self is not transparent to itself. Um, and so a lot of the insights that I, I find most compelling about philosophy that comes after phenomenology or classical phenomenology, um, I think you can already sort of ground within phenomenology. So I think if you take the example of selfhood, for instance, um, this idea that we tend to go around our daily lives presuming that there is some such thing as a self that we can either be more or less connected to, right? I, I might have better or worse self-knowledge, or I might be living more authentically or less authentically. Oftentimes, that perspective uh, is rooted in misunderstanding the self as a thing that is similar to other entities in the world, such as the book or the phone or the water glass. And in fact, what phenomenology attends to is the sense that actually the self is is fundamentally different from entities in the world um, because it has this peculiar character of being a perspective or of relating to a perspective. And so if we actually ground the idea of the self in an understanding of consciousness, then we suddenly see that the self is not a thing. Um, it is a, a, perhaps a series of relations or a nothingness, to put it in the existential phenomenological sense. Um, you get, for instance, Paul Ricoeur's notion of narrative identity coming out of the phenomenological tradition where Ricoeur says that, yeah, the self is not some entity, but rather... Uh, we are kind of always in process of crafting the self through a dialectical relationship between our consciousness and the stories that we tell ourselves about ourselves. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so maybe um, picking up on that, so the self also uh, almost has this double role of being the means and also the object of, of uh, phenomenology in a sense, because yeah. we have to um, look at ourselves, and we have to, what Husserl would say, we have to be some sort of pure consciousness. Other phenomenologists would probably disagree and say, no, the self is um, a priori, um, yeah. also includes uh, this feeling of embodiment or this being ecstatically directed towards the um, outside world and so on. Uh, so, would you say that for you, there's one? sort of phenomenological attitude that would most come closely to your way of of reflecting on things so what would the self mm -hmm. be that is operational for you in, in this sense yeah well it's a, a funny time for me to be asked this question because i am working that out at the moment <laughs> i have been working mostly on philosophy of sex and love in the past couple of years. And now I'm returning to my interest in selfhood, which is what I wrote my dissertation about. But like I said, with sort of a different perspective, because I'm now more invested in phenomenology than I was then when I was really trying to craft a more post-structuralist view of the self. So I was going with the existential phenomenological idea of the self as nothingness um, and this relation between subjectivity and self as object uh, that has this fundamental fissure or gap within it. And that really comes out of Jean-Paul Sartre and um, to some extent, Simone de Beauvoir. Recently, I've been questioning this a bit um, because I've been reading more seriously a philosopher who is not a phenomenologist, Gilles Deleuze, who has issues with the notion that uh, difference should be thought of as negativity, as negation, as we might say in, in uh, Sartre's parlance, nothingness. So I'm trying to work out right now whether I agree with that and want to rethink the notion of negativity or nothingness in relation to the self. Um, so I'm not quite sure. I will say I'm definitely drawing in my work on selfhood, 
so this is the very beginning of a of what will become a book on the topic. So stay tuned for how this develops. But I will definitely be drawing from Sartre and Beauvoir. I will also be drawing from post-structuralist traditions, um, feminist phenomenology as well. In particular, I've been really interested in the work of Mariana Ortega in recent years, who has this book in between about Latina feminist phenomenology and selfhood, articulating this notion of the multiplicitous self that is uh, nonetheless somehow unified. And Ortega is drawing mostly from Heidegger for this view when we're talking in terms of the, the more traditional phenomenology aspect of things. Um, I also think that Michelle Henry and Paul Ricoeur have lots of interesting things to offer in this regard. Uh, as well as Husserl and Heidegger and Meryl Ponty. So, so I don't know. I, I really want to bring together a lot of different strands from these thinkers having moved from a post-structuralist attitude to more of an attitude of existential phenomenology and now being in more of a place where I'm just wanting to synthesize all these insights from different <laughs> phenomenological traditions as well. But, you know, in terms of contemporary phenomenology, I will say another big influence on me from the very beginning has been the work of Dan Zahavi um, and his his work on selfhood and alterity. So I think, you know, he's drawing a lot from Husserl and Sartre in particular. And um, his work has been influential for me since the days that I was writing my dissertation and adopting more of a post-structuralist perspective. Maybe just um, questioning again. So this it sounds like you, you move from this post-structuralist to more phenomenological viewpoint. So, of course, I, I don't know exactly what you mean by post-structuralist, but I would imagine it would be something along the lines of that we cannot, um, say, take this cogito-like self as a starting point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sounds always already too late or there's a this difference and so on. And so, as you say, Derrida was critical of phenomenology because phenomenologists like Husserl were kind of um, starting with this, this self, this like, um, yeah. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I like the word cogito because it just signifies this sort of um, coherent first person perspective. Yeah. And um, would you say that you rediscovered or discovered this um, coherence or this perspective after you moving away from the post-structuralist um, research, in a sense? Is this what phenomenology had to, to offer, in a way? Yeah, yeah. It's so funny that you mentioned the word coherence, because that was already coming to mind for me as you were first starting to ask the question. I view post-structuralism, which is, of course, a sort of strange term, um, as with most philosophical schools, like phenomenology, I guess, is a school where a lot of people describe themselves as phenomenologists, but existentialism, post-structuralism are a bit different in the sense that most of the thinkers that we would associate with both of those movements did not actually identify as uh, as such. So I would say that post-structuralism, even though it's heterogeneous and a bit of a blurry term, involves a set of views that preserves the emphasis you find in structuralism on context and positionality, but resist the idea that structures are internally coherent wholes, which you tend to find more in structuralism. And so post-structuralism will emphasize things like remainders, exclusions, indeterminacy of meaning. And you're right that a lot of times that goes along with uh, either a destruction of selfhood completely or a notion of the self as internally fractured, uh, not transparent to itself, other to itself, etc. And a lot of that I, I really quite agree with, but I think I got to this point at which I realized that coherence is, is not a bad thing. <laughs> and a lot of times when we're focusing on indeterminacy and incoherence, we are nonetheless striving for some modicum of coherence in the end. And so my dissertation was on Derrida's, uh, or, or was on tracing a Derridian concept of selfhood, let's say that, and on saying that the self is other to itself, um, and yet nonetheless, there is some ipseity involved. And so I think what a lot of my early work on Derrida was uh, trying to do was show that, that Derrida doesn't actually get rid of the self, 
there is still a self there. And I think that's true. And I, I think still like that's hopefully an interesting point to make because I don't think it's well understood within Derrida scholarship. But I ended up wanting to say something more constructive, right? It's not just enough to say like there is still a self in Derrida. And with all due respect to Derrida, who's a thinker that I am still interested in, I ended up feeling like there wasn't enough there um, that actually helped me understand what the self is and what was there ended up sort of reverting back to phenomenology. And so I think what we can already find in phenomenology, this notion of the fractured self that is other to itself, that is not transparent to itself. We find that in Sartre. Uh, Christina Howell's book on Sartre and Derrida was really big for me in this regard because she shows that the insights that Derrida has on, on this are sort of already there in Sartre. Um, and I think in, in perhaps more productive ways. So as of this moment, I'm thinking about the coherence of the self as, uh, yeah, perhaps a regulative ideal, or maybe we want to say a fiction. I have to figure out what terminology I want to use specifically around that. But it's not it's it's not something that is ever achieved. And yet I do think it is a goal worth striving for. I think it's important that we aim for something like integrity uh, rather than simply saying, well, the self is multiple and that's that, or the self is not a thing and that's that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, also as you mentioned, because um, at least as long as we're doing theory and we're having like a series of, of thoughts that somehow form into a bigger sense, then at least the instance that has these thoughts and that makes this experience and, and has this sort of enlightenment has to be some form of at least epistemic self and and that's almost yeah. one of the like first forms where phenomen phenomenology even uh, in that's in terms of which the phenomen phenomenology is thought of the self mm -hmm. right? because yeah it's, uh, in the beginning it was really just this instance that got to know the world and it was able to like um, go through a series of perceptions and, and cogitations to to uh yeah Totally. Just a super quick thought on that is that I think sometimes phenomenology gets stereotyped as being uh, a, a method or school, whatever we want to call it, um, that fetishizes the notion of subjective first person consciousness and perhaps selfhood. And I think that is not at all the case. Like it is in phenomenology that you find a really robust account of the limitations of subjectivity, of the way that subjectivity is always already related to the social context in which it finds itself and, and so on and so forth. A lot of these insights that we associate with other movements that, um, that are, you know, perhaps opposed to phenomenology on the surface. And and as you say, so one of the probably contemporary challenges to, to phenomenology more broadly is to, to, to find a balance between being able to make uh, um, claims or statements about consciousness and, and, and structures as a whole, and then dealing with the situatedness of our knowledge and also of the situation from out of which we do phenomenology also, and in and, 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 and which we generalize. Um, so maybe one question, um, which you also um, kind of talked about a little, so post-structuralism, most people who work on post-structuralist authors wouldn't consider themselves post-structuralist, whereas many phenomenologists are readily um, counting themselves among like the the club, so to speak. And uh, yeah. from the start, there was a lot of like talk about the phenomenological movement and the schools. And so um, would you say that today there's still a very strong sense of being either a phenomenologist or not, does it make a difference? Um, or is it more like that we today have sort of such a multitude of different phenomenologies that it doesn't mm. make sense almost to use this term in this sort of unifying fashion? Yeah. I'm really glad you asked this question because it allows me to talk about a pet peeve of mine, <laughs> which is when people use phenomenology as a synonym for just like experience. <laughs> so for instance, I see this a lot among analytic philosophers. They're like, oh, the phenomenology of 
X, right? The phenomenology of consciousness, the phenomenology of love, and all they mean is a description of the experience of this thing. And I understand that language changes over time and words take on new meanings, but especially in a climate in which, at least where I live in the US, phenomenology and other traditions that are associated with continental European philosophy are consistently marginalized, if not excluded altogether, the co-optation of this term to mean something that is really completely removed from its tradition and history, not to mention a lot more shallow in my respect, um, is a problem. Like, I do think that when people say the phenomenology of love or the phenomenology of consciousness, they should at least be engaging with the robust tradition of phenomenology that's been happening for a hundred years or more than a hundred years at this point, um, which has had a lot to say about those things, right? And we can conceive of phenomenology differently, of course, but I think it's important that people who are using the term are doing so with an awareness of this actual philosophical school. Um, so perhaps that is a kind of backwards way into your your final uh, formulation of the question, which is that, yeah, I totally think we should still use the the word phenomenology. I think it's super useful um, because it allows us to to describe what we are or to designate rather what we are talking about when we are using the tools that phenomenology offers. Um, and perhaps there are more tools that that phenomenology hasn't invented yet that we will then, you know, bring into the phenomenological fold. But things like the, you know, the epoche, um, things like an understanding of time consciousness, um, understanding of like what are some other, there's so many philosophical uh, terms from phenomenology that we could use, even lived experience. That's, I think, a pretty big one here. That people bandy about all the time today and that I see as quite, you know, rooted in the phenomenological tradition um, is important. And then we can have fun arguments about what we want to consider phenomenology and whether we want to like continue the uh continue the Husserlian tradition or take up the mantle of Merleau-Ponty or go in completely different directions with critical phenomenology. Um but I think that those conversations are best informed by a uh, robust engagement with the tradition of phenomenology. It would be sort of weird if I started saying I'm doing analytic philosophy of consciousness and I just meant analysis like in a very vague <laughs> sense without any understanding of the history of analytic philosophy. And I think the same is true of phenomenology. Absolutely. And I think just in terms of the cooperation between different stand, strands of philosophy, I think phenomenology can be a great corrective or, or at yeah. least a supplement to just other philosophies who do not do not have the conceptual apparatus to even deal with yeah. perception in a in a more uh, yeah deeper sense or to do yeah. more detail. About that. Yeah, I think just as an example, I know I had mentioned my work on sex and love before, but I didn't really have a chance to talk about it yet. Um, the phenomenology of sex, I think, is a really great example of this. Uh, I have a recent piece on sexual consent where I'm trying to bring a phenomenological perspective to bear on analytic uh, critiques, or let's say, no, I mean, I'm doing the critique. Some people are doing critiques anyway, <laughs> but bad word there. Um, analytic conceptions of consent. And I'm saying, hey, we really need to bring in a phenomenological account of sexual consent. But what I don't mean by that is just like a, a analysis, an ungrounded analysis of what it is like to have sex. Like that would be sort of a weird thing to do. Um, I'm trying to bring to bear specific notions from phenomenology that have been very well articulated over decades, such as how we perceive others and the nature of our embodiment that I think can inform the way that we're thinking about sexual consent. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And um, we will talk about that a little more when we talk about your paper in uh, just a few minutes. So maybe just um, a quick question or, or some questions uh, to you as a public philosopher, because you also have a, a YouTube channel, Overthink, and a podcast, which is also called Overthink, mm -hmm. um, where you yeah talk with others about current issues, but in a philosophically informed way. And also you give like these short precise of uh, different philosophical ideas, which I find very um, successful in the way that you, you do them. And um, of course, the motivation for doing public philosophy in a way is making philosophical ideas more broadly available. But um, yeah. would that be the, the only motivation or is there 
or what was the uh, reason behind um, going sort of uh, into the, the YouTube and into the social media sphere? Okay. Yeah, I think I have different answers to, to those two questions. Um, I would say that for me, yes, going into public philosophy does have to do with trying to make philosophical ideas more broadly accessible. Another motivation there is just to highlight how important philosophy is. I think philosophy has always been important, <laughs> and I think it remains very important today. But we're also living in an age, especially in the U.S., where philosophy is seen as sort of an abstruse, uh, abstract, maybe even random discipline, right? And I'm like, you all are calling one of the most foundational disciplines in the history of the world random? Like, no. <laughs> in fact, most of the disciplines that we know and recognize today originate in philosophy, things that were traditionally part of anthropology, sociology, psychology, uh, cultural studies, politics, not to mention all of the natural sciences originally were part of philosophy, right? Biology, was natural philosophy and Aristotle wrote about it. So I think I also want to just like help shift the narrative in the US around what philosophy is and what the role of it is. Uh, I do a lot of my philosophical work on French thinkers and have spent a good deal of time in France. And I'd love to see American discourse shift a little bit more towards what they have in France, which is a situation in which Philosophers are interviewed on mainstream radio programs. Um, they're talked about, their ideas are talked about on TV, right? On uh, the, even in the daily news, they're coming up. They're writing op-eds in newspapers. They're, uh, if I go to a bar in France and somebody asks what I do, or I'm at a party and I say I'm a philosopher, they're not just like, oh, weird and exotic. They actually have stuff to talk about with me. And in the US, a lot of the problem is that we don't have philosophy in high schools. And so philosophy is not something that most people have encountered before they get to college, if they get to college. And so I understand that there are some, you know, quite material reasons for the, the apparent randomness of philosophy in the US, but I want to do what I can to shift that. And I've been really delighted to see that a lot of our work has been reaching high school students who then are interested in reading philosophy on their own or pursuing it in college. So um, in terms of how I originally got into this, the reason I say that, that that's a little bit of a different answer is that I don't think I had such big ambitions then as I do now, having seen after a couple of years of doing public philosophy, the kind of impact that it can have. When I originally uh, started the podcast with my co-host, David Pena Guzman, it was certainly with an interest in, uh, you know, making philosophy seem interesting to people who might not otherwise encounter it. But it was mostly just this sense of like, hey, we both want to be doing some public philosophy. We think a podcast would be fun. We really like talking to each other. We have good conversations. Uh, we have this training in the history of philosophy and continental European philosophy, which uh, in the US are, are not, that's not like the norm for your training in philosophy. And so, hey, let's put our conversations on air and see what happens. And then things just took unexpected turns after that. We started some social media accounts in order to draw attention to the podcast. And we've had mostly students running those for us in the past couple of years. And then I had just read online that it was helpful to uh, put your podcast on YouTube for search engine purposes. So we put the podcast on YouTube. It didn't really get a lot of traction there because who's going to YouTube to just listen to an audio podcast. So then I had these videos that I had recorded for when I was teaching on Zoom during quarantine, during uh, the early phases of the pandemic. And they were professionally shot because I live in LA and I have a lot of um, loved ones in the film industry. And so they were, they looked kind of shiny and nice and I'd done editing on them. The editing was bad, but like, whatever, that's fine. And so I decided to just post them on YouTube and they were 10 to 15 minute uh, introductions to thinkers that then I was going to talk about in class with my students, people like Derrida, Nietzsche, Hegel, et cetera, because I was teaching a class on continental philosophy, which I teach pretty much every year. And, um, those videos just started to gain way more traction than I expected and really went viral. And so 
ironically now the podcast, which is the thing that David and I have really been putting our heart and soul into for the past couple of years, um, is, has maybe gotten a little bit less traction than the YouTube channel, even though the podcast is, is doing well. And I'm really grateful for, for all the, um, you know, all of the interest that it's garnered. But there is this sort of weird imbalance where I think in particular what has gone viral are my videos, the, the videos that you mentioned as being pressy of these thinkers. And I think that's great. Like, I'm I'm really happy that people are able to access professionally produced content um, that introduces some thinkers who are really, really hard to read on your own. And so I am I'm very happy about that. But it does sometimes make me a little bit... Um, I don't know, just uncertain in the sense that I don't want people to take away from the videos that you can fully understand Hegel's philosophy of history through watching this 10 minute thing. And so I'm also aware of the fact that the very visual economy and sort of bite sized economy of YouTube can lead to misunderstandings of intentions. And so I'm, I'm sort of trying to work with that now. And my move has just been to put out other other materials um, that really emphasize that this is not the only way to be doing philosophy. In fact, I don't actually really see myself as doing philosophy when I am recording these short videos. I think of myself as like reporting on philosophy. And there are many other ways of reporting on philosophy that are equally good. And that's not to mention all of the beautiful world of actually doing philosophy. So I'm just hoping that that this can be an invitation to people uh, rather than seeming like a replacement for doing the hard work of reading, engaging, and discussing philosophers. Yeah, and it's very interesting that you even got feedback from, from high school students, so as, as young as, uh, so to speak. Uh, the I know I, I was at a I was at a colleague's party and a, and a, and a teenager came up to me and was like, are you Ellie Anderson? I've been watching your videos. I actually got recognized on the street in New York City as well, which was mm -hmm. an exciting first time experience. <laughs> but be uh, soon to be signing autographs as well. Uh, that continues. I don't know. I don't know. Do people still do that? I, I will avoid that if possible. I guess when, when I have a book, I will happily sign copies of the book. How's that? <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Um, so... I had a few other questions which you kind of partly answered. So one was, what are the advantages and disadvantages of, of doing this in, a, in this yeah. public format? And so you already talked a little bit about the, the danger of, um, yeah, sort of breaking it down so much that we really only have like this, um, yeah, sort of presentation and, and not the... The actual engagement because the, the the introduction and the youtube format cannot replace obviously the the engagement with reading a book and uh, mm -hmm. having to read sentences over and over again and and, and, uh, and all that stuff but um so but still i'm going to ask the question so the mm -hmm. what are some of the advantages and, and disadvantages that you see yeah maybe also in terms of the um Uh, uh, future of uh, philosophy presentation or philosophy on the internet and, and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it probably goes without saying that I think the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. And that would include the short videos that I was just talking about a moment ago. Like I'm still producing them because I think that they have more advantages than disadvantages uh, by far. I think the advantages... Um, are one just yeah this this really increased accessibility for viewers and listeners as well as for those of us on the other side who want to engage in public philosophy when i first started graduate school uh in 2011 i knew that i was interested in public philosophy but the way that seemed open to me at the time was being a public philosopher by writing books and writing books perhaps paired with a blog or and or speaking engagements. And I had a blog for like a hot minute when I was in grad school, realized it was a lot of work and I didn't have time for that in grad school. And so I left that aside. I didn't really do any public philosophy for a number of years. I also had four years on the job market before I got my position. And so, you know, the grueling realities of academia prevented me after my dissertation from really making good on my desire to, to go into public philosophy. And so by the time I actually was then ready to, to go forth and, and aim for, uh, for this dream that I'd had a long time for a long time, 
there were suddenly all of these new avenues, right? There's podcasting. And so that was the avenue that David and I really chose. But I think I've also been recently opened up to video as a medium, whether that's through YouTube or through short form content such as TikTok. I think TikTok is great. I know there are a lot of major problems with TikTok, of course, but I've learned a lot about TikTok or I've learned a lot from TikTok. Like I've learned uh, about the history of a particular type of chair. I've learned about um, different artworks. I've learned recipes. Like there's so much. I've learned uh, financial advice from TikTok. And I'm not really so much right now in the philosophy TikTok space, but I do think that there's a lot of opportunity there for just sparking people's interest. Um, one way, one place that I'm I'm trying to maybe get into a little bit more when it comes to TikTok right now or at least playing around with the idea of is book recommendations. Because as you see this bookshelf behind me, I have this bookshelf in the background in my YouTube videos, and I get asked all the time about the books that are in it. And TikTok, I think, is a really good place for offering short book reviews and book recommendations. And one of the benefits of that, in addition to just like exposing people to philosophy, is that it also can be a really good promotional tool for those of us who are academics, because academic books are not known for having very broad audiences. Some academic books aren't going to have a broad audience, no matter how much promotion they receive, because they're too filled with jargon, they're too high level, and that's okay. Not every book needs to be publicly accessible to everybody. But there are a lot of books that are absolutely amazing, written by academics, that are written in a way that is super engaging for a public audience, but the public audience just doesn't know that they exist because academic presses don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to put into marketing. <laughs> so I think it helps to democratize not only access to ideas, but also the the books and ideas that are uh, sort of publicly available, right? I, as a philosophy professor, can go on TikTok and recommend books that I think are better than some of the books that are showing up on, say, like a New York Times bestselling nonfiction list. And so I think that is amazing, that ability for for everyday folks to to get the word out about their or others' ideas that they think are important. And as far as the disadvantages go, um, I mentioned the the visual economy of YouTube. And I think that I would say generally is true of social media. There is, uh, we just did an overthink series on vision <laughs> and, um, or sorry, it was an overthink series on the senses. And we had an episode on vision within that. And that provided an opportunity for me to think a lot more about the, the nature of vision itself. And I think there's a lot to say about that, but, but one is just this kind of flattening that happens when you're watching a video uh on a you know it's like a two-dimensional uh video on a on a screen and um there that i think that two-dimensionality of social media whether it's through a still image such as instagram or through moving images in youtube or tiktok entrenches a notion of subject object distinction and this idea that you just need to sort of get the gist of the object and um are you there oh sorry <laughs> something something just popped up on my screen and it looked like you disappeared speaking of visual economies <laughs> just seeing you in this 2d way um i think it i, I think it can lead to this sort of false objectivity, as well as a notion of, um, yeah, just like shallowness, right? A two-dimensional screen is by definition as shallow as it gets. And I think there's something to be said about the way that that very economy also translates into how we experience ideas. And there's tons of research, of course, on the way that social media shortens our attention span. That is very, very worrisome to me. Um, as a professor who really wants people to read Deleuze, to read Hegel, to read people who take a ton of time. Um, the way that that social media tends to shorten our attention spans is hugely problematic. Thank you. Yeah. And I also see then, so yeah, one of the, I guess, uh, um, dangers is the, the, the temporality of thinking is not necessarily uh, identical to the temporality of of media and of the succession of ideas as they are presented, and maybe 
there is not the time to to actually digest uh, um, what you're hearing and, and seeing. Totally. Um, maybe just as a as a last question, um, and you also spoke a little bit about this. Do you think that there's some kinds of philosophy that inherently lend themselves more to to being publicly presented and discussed? I mean, you mentioned you do a lot of um, continental philosophy. Mm -hmm. And if I, for instance, um, look at YouTube um, and other YouTubers who are doing public philosophy there, most of them are also more talking about maybe Foucault and, and Deleuze and you know political philosophy, social yeah. philosophy, and so on, which is, uh, for, for a great part, not exactly the philosophy that it's being taught and discussed in academia. So this is mm -hmm. maybe almost like a dichotomy between two kinds of uh, philosophy or would that be an uh, an, uh, uh, expression? Yeah, I am not sure because I, I put that stuff in my public philosophy because that's what I do in my scholarship as well. <laughs> um, I do think that figure-based public philosophy tends to be more salient for people than problem-based public philosophy. For instance, if I have a video that has a famous philosopher in the title, it's liable to garner far more views than if I have a video that has a problem in the title. And that doesn't mean that people shouldn't be doing pro problem-based public philosophy, but it just, if we're talking in terms of sheer success rather than like su success as, as measured by popularity, which is of course not the only way to measure success. I think, I think figure-based philosophy is going to be more salient to people. Um, also people are obsessed in this, like, I think way that we can only understand, um, on a capitalist uh, on a sort of capitalist critical account of commodity fetishism with books on social media right and so i mentioned that i think like book talk on tiktok is super popular and um i don't think that's a bad thing like i think it's great for people to be exposed to books but i think the public philosophy that revolves around a particular book or a particular thinker is going to be more likely to get off the ground than problem based philosophy I don't necessarily love that though. And, and like our podcast itself, the audio podcast is a uh, topic based. So, and then we will mention thinkers within that. And I think podcasting is a better medium for doing public philosophy that is problem based than say the more visual, um, the, the visual stuff, which is the social media stuff, uh, which I think is, is perhaps a little bit more related to the fetish of, of well-known thinkers. So I don't know. I mean, Maybe I will aim for more problem-based um, visual forms of public philosophy, but that is sort of one thing that first comes to mind. Um, I also think that the conversations that are happening within academic philosophy, for very good reason, are far more narrow and nuanced than can actually usually be successfully discussed in a public philosophy context. I think it is totally fine that not everything that academic philosophers talk about at conferences is going to make sense to people who are going to YouTube for philosophy in a public setting. And so I think like I wear very different hats when I'm doing public philosophy, even within my different forms of public philosophy, as I mentioned, like I'm, I have a different hat for podcasting than I have for these short YouTube videos than I have for a TikTok book recommendation. But I also have very different hats for when I'm doing my scholarship. And um, I even have multiple hats within that. I mean, I'm, I work on the self as multiple, so perhaps that's unsurprising. But I think they're, they're, it's just a matter of audience, right? Who is your audience? And when I'm talking to an audience of phenomenologists, that's going to be different from when I'm talking to an audience of uh, a more general audience, but still of academic philosophers than when I'm talking to different forms of, of public audiences. Um, I do think that a lot of philosophers could do more to make their ideas salient beyond uh, an academic context. And I think that that would be really helpful for showing how great philosophy is. I myself am really trying to work hard to strategize how in the future to help amplify other voices within academic philosophy. Um, and at the same time, it, it's nobody's, it's like not the fault of academic philosophers that they're not addressing a public audience when they're not addressing that. I think sometimes people are like, these academic philosophers are just stuck in this ivory tower. And 
I think that's a really unfair characterization. We get trained for years in skills that actually kind of alienate us from public discourse. Um, and some of that is with good reason, because we need to be able to have certain kinds of conversations that are more jargon filled than everyday conversation. Not to mention, we are all so busy. Like I basically have two jobs being a public philosopher and uh, an academic philosopher. Uh, it is hugely time consuming and we're not trained to actually be able to, to make ideas really salient to certain kinds of audiences. That said, we have teaching skills and teaching skills, I think, can really be the gateway for academic philosophers to doing more public philosophy. That's literally how my YouTube videos started. They were they were not only inspired by my teaching, they were part of my teaching. They were introductions to conversations that I had with my college classroom. OK, well, thank you very much for being on the podcast. And uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much, Daniel.